Well, welcome to the banks of the Artichoke River. In, uh, we are in northeastern Massachusetts on a beautiful Sunday morning. Nice breeze blowing. Um, and I'm glad that you're all here watching. Uh, my name is Bob Metcalf, and uh, I teach tracking for the Boston Outdoor School, tracking classes, and I've been teaching classes for about 30 years through other organizations and through my own business, New England Discovery. And my interest in tracking actually started with an interest in local wildlife. Uh, ever since I was very young, I've always been really fascinated with the animals that live outside and find their own food and shelter, what they could possibly be doing on a winter night to survive until the next morning. So that was my motivation for learning uh, as much as I can about tracking. When I started, I thought it would be a short journey, you know, a year or two, and I would have it all down. Well, as I said, it's been over 30 years, and I'm still, I'm still learning new things every time I go out. Uh, what nature has to show us is endless, and that's really part of the excitement of it all. We have a group of people that have been coming back to Boston Outdoor School once a month, uh, going on tracking explorations, and um, we had to stop because of the pandemic. And I really miss that aspect of tracking classes, having all of you who have come, your enthusiasm and your uh, interest and your questions have really made it uh, an enjoyable experience for me. So I'm looking forward to the time when we can get back to that again. But today uh, will be a little different. The big difference is you won't be here, but uh, uh, hopefully that will change soon. Um, we'll be moving around a little bit uh, normally, we'd be exploring larger areas to see what we can find for tracks and sign, but because this is a live presentation, any time we spend uh, moving around will be time with you just watching me walk, which doesn't sound like a lot of fun. So we're not going to move around as much as we normally do. The other thing that's going to be different about today is that we will do some identification and some exploration, depending on what we find. But we, uh, I'd like to focus on some of the things that you can do without being in a tracking class. When you can't come to a tracking class, when you're off by yourself or with your friends, uh, I'd like to share some activities and, and methods that have helped me over the years to learn uh, on my own. And uh, so let's get started along those lines. So I'll be doing a little talking here first and then we'll do some exploring and then we'll have some time at the end for questions. To learn on your own, I think one of the really important things you want to do is find a good field, field guide to work out of. Um, I'm still using the one that I started with 30 something years ago. It's uh, Tracking in the Art of Seeing by Paul Rezendis. Um, really good stuff about local wildlife, uh, tracks and sign, good information. Um, and as you can see, my book is full of notes here, all kinds of scribbles and things about things I've seen along the way. What is actually a better way to do it, I think, is to uh, have a journal. Have some kind of a journal with you that you can write down your observations. Uh, have location, date and time is important for when you look back later at this stuff. Also, I find it's really good to write down questions that come up. There'll, there'll be lots of questions as you look at things that you're not sure exactly what it is uh, or some behavior you haven't seen before in wildlife. Write the questions down because it's, it can be really hard to remember them later. That way when you get home and you have the time, you can do some research and find out about that. So, good field guide. Another thing I carry is uh, something produced by David Brown. He's in central Massachusetts, uh, excellent tracker. He has some really good books out, but he makes these track cards that are life size of each animal foot. And it can be a big help sometimes just to drop this down next to a track when you see one. Kind of give you an idea of the drawings. 
And let's see, what else? Um, a book I don't carry with me, but I would recommend from a behavioral standpoint, animal behavior is certain, understanding animal behavior is certainly a big part of tracking. And this book by uh, Mark Elbrock and Kurt Reinhardt, Behavior, North American Mammals, really good stuff. A little heavy to carry around, so this is a stay at home book for me. Okay, so to start off, especially if you're just starting, but I guess at any point really, what helped me a lot was to pick one animal. Um, and not just any animal at random, but an animal maybe that you've really been interested in, that you've wondered about, maybe an animal that you've had a lot of encounters with, um, and an animal that's close by. So you can go to some of the places where that animal is and look for tracks and sign and maybe the animal itself. So once you pick your animal, you can do some research on behavior. Um, what type of habitat are you likely to find that animal in? What time of day is it gonna be active? Learn its tracks and sign, draw some tracks, uh, learn some of the sign, and try to find an area locally where you can uh, find that animal track and sign. So when I say focus on one animal, I don't mean to the exclusion of everything else of all the other animals, but I believe that the trail of your animal will connect you to everything else in nature. It will bring you to places where other animals have been. So now you've got a new one to research. It'll show you plants you haven't seen before that it's eating. Go look those up. Um, that animal will be your guide, your teacher. And that's something that's really worked well for me. It's also kind of a motivation. If it's an animal you're really interested in and really care about, that's what's going to get you out of bed when it's still dark out. So you're at the site at sunrise and um, keep you out maybe a little longer when the rain starts because you want to follow the trail. So I think of tracking or working with uh, tracks and sign as a way to learn about wildlife. That's why I do it. And um, I sort of think of it in three steps. First is discovery. You have to find the tracks of the sign. Um, and that requires a little research. Uh, where are the animals likely to be? You can also just stumble on tracks and sign. That's gonna happen all the time as you get more familiar with it. Um, so, and a big part of the discovery process, a huge part, is being aware, and I'm gonna come back to that later because we're gonna do a few activities that I think help bring us into a state where we're present and we're really paying attention to what's around us. Uh, so awareness is a big part of discovery. The second part, second step in the process is identification. And I guess that's what probably most people think about when they think about working with tracks and sign. That's where your field guide is gonna come in really handy. Um, and uh, animal tracks can be really difficult. They don't usually look like the nice picture in the book. Uh, there's a lot of variability. The substrate can be muddy or sandy or dry or wet or snow or sleet or and the way the animal is moving. Animals feet are very flexible. So birders have, I think what they call field marks. It's certain characteristics on a bird that help with a positive identification. So we can kind of do field marks in tracking. So there's some features that you will not always, but almost always see in a track. And I kind of call those field marks, even though the track might look differently. And just as an example, got some rubber rubber animal feet. Doesn't everybody carry animal feet in their pocket here? So so let's see if we can, I can hold this steady enough to show you. This is a raccoon replica of a raccoon foot. Raccoons have five toes in the front and rear. Very flexible toes. They can spread them really widely. They can pull them back and extend them. Sometimes raccoon tracks have skinny little toes. Sometimes they have more shortened bulbous, bulbous toes just by how the animal moves its foot. But if you look at the side of a raccoon track, how is that? Is that okay? 
Um, you can see that the toes are on a higher plane than the palm pads in this part of the track. So as the toes come back, there's a place where all of a sudden the track drops deeper. And the rest of the track is deeper than the toes are. And what that does is it makes a C shape right here that um, is almost like a cliff. The, if you walked back in the toes, you'd fall off the cliff into the, into the palm pad. So that is what I would call a field mark on a raccoon track. Most of the time you're going to see that, and it's very characteristic. Uh, just as in another example, most everybody knows what a deer track looks like, this nice heart shape. But again, even hooves are flexible. These toes can spread really widely. Uh, sometimes you'll only see the tips of the toes. The animal's weight is on the front of the, of the foot. Sometimes they'll sink so deeply that two extra toes will show. So there's a lot of variability. What I would maybe consider a field mark, field mark on a deer track is the space between the hooves. Even though it can change, there's always a ridge down the middle. So that's just one more, one more characteristic. So we've kind of gone through two steps of the process, the discovery and the identification. And next comes the most fun part, the interpretation. So we see that this animal is here, but that's when all the questions start. Why is it here? What was it doing? Where did it come from? Where is it going? How is that animal's presence affecting all the rest of the environment around it? Other animals, what plants is it eating? What kind of predators might be after it? So. Um, this is when your animal becomes the teacher and shows you, know, who would know the forest better than the deer and the fox and the fisher? So that's kind of the three steps of tracking in my mind and it helps me to remember those and kind of do the process in the right order. So getting down to tracks and sign, uh, animal, tr animal sign is everywhere. It's everywhere. I picked this spot to start because I see some stuff that's interesting right off the bat. Um, one thing we have over here, the tops of logs are really good places to look for animal sign. Scat, different animals like to walk on logs and scat is often on top of a log. It's also on top of a log too because scat is often a uh, communication mode. Uh, the animal wants other animals to see the scat. It's saying something with that, with that message. The other thing that logs are good for is they're good feeding posts. And over here, we have some nuts that are chewed down in a little groove here. Um, a bunch of different stuff. I probably should put my glasses on so I know what it is. These are hickory nuts. This would come from a fairly mature tree, not a little sapling. And uh, we don't really see in the immediate area any hickory trees. So this is a disturbance in tracking. We're looking for disturbances. A hickory nut is not supposed to be in a log by the river. It's supposed to be under a hickory tree. So an animal has moved it here. And here you can see the chewing. And here's another hickory nut. This looks a lot newer, fresher, but it's, it's chewed differently. And luckily for us, different animals open up nuts in different ways. Um, this is kind of characteristic of a red squirrel opening from both sides toward that center rib. And they often go a lot further than that so that the center rib is almost like a disc that's left. Gray squirrel has larger teeth and jaws and muscles it can break the nuts up in a lot smaller fragments than red squirrels normally do. So it's a function of the strength of the animal's mandibles, but also how big is its face? How big a hole does it have to make so that it can get in and get the, uh, the meat? It's not gonna do any more work than it has to. And over the years, I've collected some, uh, some different nuts that I've actually seen the animal open. I'll just show you a few of them here. Every time I do this, I think this is the time I'm gonna dump it all on the forest floor. 
Here's a red squirrel, typical red squirrel opening. Mm -hmm. And here's more like the fragments of the gray squirrel like we just talked about. Uh, let's see, do I have some good mouse stuff? Let's see, mouse. I like to find one that has multiple small holes in it because that's more of a, a mouse, a mouse nut would, would sometimes have like four holes on a side. I don't think I have one here to show you. Uh, because they have the small little face, they can get right in there and get the meat without having to make a great big hole. And um, so quite a bit of difference. Is this the one I want here? Let's see. Oh, yeah, okay. Here's, here's looks like some mouse work, little tiny holes. And I'll show you one more. It's usually everybody's favorite. Can you see how smooth a cut that's made all the way around the top of this acorn. This time it's not a hickory nut. It's like a bevel. It almost looks like someone did it with a can opener. This is a work of flying squirrel. They make this really clean, nice, smooth opening. And uh, we actually have a lot of flying squirrels around here. We just don't get to see them because they're nocturnal and pretty shy. So we can get a pretty good idea what kind of squirrels are around here just by the nuts that we find. Now everything in tracking is not so much a rule, it's more like a guideline. So if I found one nut that was opened a certain way, I might have an idea what it was, but I couldn't be sure. I need to find a whole bunch of them that all look the same in the same area and that's going to be more, more information that that really is uh, the kind of squirrel that I think it is. And all the tracking stuff is like that. It's like we're weighing the evidence. It's rarely that one thing is the answer. It's like if you picture a balance scale. We put a little bit of evidence on this side for this animal and oops, well, it kind of looks a little like that. And eventually we get enough on one side that we can, we can make a determination whether we're identifying a track or sign or anything. Um, we've also got, if you take a look right here, some old beaver chew on this blueberry. Um, after trees or shrubs are cut like this, often they kind of explode in growth in this stuff that's called coppice. And this is really tender, really good eating stuff. So you would normally expect if the beavers were still around that they would uh, come back and get this stuff too. It looks delicious. But um, it doesn't look like it right here. But that's not the whole story. We need to really look around. We've got some more beaver, old beaver chew over there. And here is an alder that got hit pretty good by the beavers at some point. You can see the 45 degree angle cut, the tooth marks there. And this coppice, this alder coppice, is being eaten. Can you see that its leaves are chopped off here? And, but it doesn't look like that nice clean beaver cut. This looks more like deer brows. Deer um, don't have top teeth in the front of their mouth. So what they do is they pinch vegetation between their palate and lower teeth and break it off really roughly so it'll have this rough look to it. So it looks like the deer have been back at this alder after the, uh, after the beaver cut it and had this coppice growing. Uh, okay, here we go. So, so, so far we haven't seen any fresh beaver sign. We know that there were beaver here, but there's some stuff down here that looks pretty, pretty fresh. Oh, these are some beaver chew sticks. If you can see the end there, you can see the teeth marks if I hold it at the right angle, maybe. And this would have been feeding. Um, beaver use wood for a lot of things. It's a building material for dams and lodges. Uh, it's also food, the green growing layer right under the bark, the cambium layer. 
is uh, beaver food, one of the beaver foods. So this looks like a little snack was going on here. Maybe a, a work break, a lunch break and a snack on the shore here. What else? Have, we've also got, can you see that there are grasses, sedges or grasses that are, here's one right here. that are broken off, they're floating all around here. I don't see, I don't see any sedges growing here. So this stuff is probably drifted in, there's some out there, drifted in from somewhere else. Looks like the current's going that way. This is an indication that uh, there's muskrat around too. Muskrat will eat grasses and sedges, but they also, especially this time of year, are making beddings in their, in their burrows and uh, They'll collect fresh bedding material uh, almost every day. Go out on land and grab mouthfuls of, or along the water's edge, grab mouthfuls of this stuff and bring it back into their, uh, their burrows. They make lodges just like beaver, only they make them not out of wood, but out of uh, aquatic plants and grasses, cattail, things like that. But on a body of water like this, which is probably too deep to start a, start a lodge, they would likely have bank burrows. So they would be digging into the bank and then up under the upland area. And that's, that's where they would live in these, these bank burrows under the, under the shoreline. So, sign is everywhere. You know, and, the, and the, the more you look, the more you see. Staying in one place can really be good sometimes, you know, because the, you see things after a few minutes that you didn't see at first, and an hour later you see a little more that you didn't see. So um, just have to keep our eyes open. And that's where the awareness part of this comes in. I'd like to move into the upland a little bit here. Just put a few of these things away. Let's, let's just go right up right up here, Elliot. Elliot is our cameraman. I didn't introduce him, but he's Elliot from Boston Outdoor School is behind the camera here. And maybe if you just went up there a little ways and I'll walk toward you. That's good, okay. So, you set aside this special day to be out in the woods and you get here and what happens to me a lot of times is I'm here but I'm not. I'm thinking about what I should have done yesterday and what I need to do tomorrow and uh, there's a voice racing in my mind about all kinds of stuff. I need to get rid of that. I need to be right here, right now, because that's where the lesson is. That's what nature wants to teach us. So there's a few things that I do that kind of help me do that. One is, I guess, I don't know a lot about meditation, but if you do, this is a good way to start, you know, whatever works for you in your meditation. Take a deep breath, pay attention to your breathing, relax your muscles. And I like to do what I call a slow walk. I take one step and I still have my weight on both feet. It's just one step so I'm comfortable. I can stay here for a few seconds. And I'm gonna stay here until I notice two or three things. I'm gonna look around, okay? You don't have to label things. You don't have to identify it. I'm gonna a little bit so you know what I'm looking at, but got a red maple sapling here. We've got a pine cone. Uh, a little Canada Mayflower. Okay, maybe I'll take another step. What do I see? What do I hear? Any sounds? What I'm trying to do is fill my mind so full of sensory input that there's no room to think. 
my whole mind is trying to get to a point where I'm paying attention to what I see, what I hear, what I smell. Are there scents in the air? I'll take another step. Relax and look. This is a great exercise to do before you start, before you start on your tracking adventure. Um, the other thing that is kind of good to think of at this point, I read a book years ago, I believe it was written by John Young, and uh, he talked about something called bubbles, bubble concepts. I'm pretty sure that's what he called it. It goes like this. We have different kinds of bubbles that surround us. Some of them are bubbles of perception. In other words, if I look around, how far can I see in all directions, up and down? The limits to how far I see is the edge of my bubble of visual perception. And then how about hearing? Can I hear sounds how far away? I don't mean like really loud sounds that you could hear for miles. I'm talking about sounds like a twig snapping under a deer's foot or the rustle of a squirrel in the leaves, those kinds of sounds. And scents, how about smells? As a tracker, you'll come to be able to identify wildlife just by the scent. When you're in an area, you'll know that there's beaver there, that there's fox there, that there's deer there. You'll know by scent. Um, the other kind of bubbles are bubbles of disturbance. How far can my noise be heard? How far does my bubble extend? Am I making a lot of noise, snapping sticks, stomping through the forest? Um, and visually, am I moving really fast, which makes my visual bubble really big? I can be seen from far off by moving too fast. The idea is to make your bubbles of disturbance smaller than your bubbles of what your senses can determine. And that's the way we're going to get to see wildlife. We need to be able to hear them farther away than they can hear us. Quiet, move slowly. And another reason to do it is it's just the right thing to do. It's respectful of the animals. This is their, we're in their world. Um, being quiet is being respectful. So that exercise will kind of get you started and to slow down. I usually do it for maybe 10 minutes. Sometimes it's really hard for me to do it. I don't know if that will be like that with everybody, but I take a step and I, oh, I, want, I don't want to stay here, I want to go. Those are the times I need it the most that I really need to slow down because I'm just going to miss stuff. Uh, so, oh, and there's an activity that I usually do with little kids. And when I finally tried it on my own, I realized how powerful it really is. I've been doing it for a long time and just thinking of it as a little kid's game. But it's called deer ears. And the idea is that uh, deer are really good at detecting sounds. And you've probably seen deer standing at the edge of a clearing, uh, sniffing the air, looking around, moving those big ears, trying to find the different sounds. It turns out that the mechanism of hearing in deer really isn't that much better than our own. What they have, their big advantage is those great big ears, those big cupped ears. So if we as humans form that deer ear like that. You want to push your fingers really tight together, no spaces, no air spaces. It's formed in a cup kind of shape. You stick it on the back of your head and push your ears forward. And when you do this, you're going to look just as silly as I do, but give it a try. It's really amazing how much it changes, how far you can hear. And you can pick out direction too this way by moving around. You might, like I do, have one ear that's much better than the other. So I have to kind of calibrate my deer ears. I have to s see something that's making a sound, maybe a red squirrel chattering at me. And I close my eyes and try to locate it. And when I open my eyes, I'll be off to the left by a little bit. So now that's my calibration if I'm really trying to pinpoint a sound. So what do you say we go explore a little bit, see what we can find here in the forest?
Um, I've got an old rotted limb on this big, uh, big oak tree. And um, there are some holes here that because of their rectangular, square, rectangular shape were probably made by pileated woodpeckers going after insects or but they also get used, these kind of holes also get used as homes for, for squirrels. They bite around the edges of the hole a little bit and kind of open it up. So, well, here we go. Here's a, here's a hickory nut under an oak tree. So again, disturbance, right? We've got some disturbance here. This looks a little bit like that classic red squirrel kind of look, but I'm only finding one. Just kind of store that away as a little information. Here's a broken piece. And sometimes you can find the holes. Not a good idea to stick your hand in these holes, but take a look and check it out. Oh, well, okay. Okay. Well, I don't know. At first I thought maybe flying squirrel, but it isn't quite as smooth as I'd expect. It is kind of a smooth bevel, so possibility. Flying squirrels love old rotted trees for homes. Actually, I think probably it is flying squirrel. But one nut isn't going to be the answer. Just a little bit of information on the scale. Okay, we have uh, some tracks here. Uh, they're not wildlife tracks though. And I'm standing right in poison ivy. Let me stop for a minute and just about that. You know, here I am standing in poison ivy. Um, we don't have a lot of real serious ha hazards in New England in the woods as far as caution. And this is not intended to be a safety uh, presentation uh, as much as a tracking presentation, but you wanna know what poison ivy looks like. And don't do what I did. Don't stand in it. Here, three leaves together. Um, they're not always green. They can be different colors in the fall. They're orange and yellow and red. And they're kind of maroon in the springtime when they first come out. That center leaf always has a little bit longer stem on it, too. Now here, poison ivy is growing as a ground plant. But it also is a vine that grows up trees. And if we see some of that, we'll stop and take a look at it. Uh, ticks. Ticks are a problem. Um, having your socks pulled over your pants helps. I don't have, I'm not doing that today, but it's a good thing to do. I also use a product called uh, permethrin that you put on your clothes and it lasts through three or four washings. You'd want to check that out yourself and see what you think about whether it's a chemical you want to use. But when I spend a lot of time in the woods, I wear my clothes that are treated with the permethrin and it seems to make a difference. I think of all the hazards that we have in New England, the biggest is ground hornets. Um, they can be really aggressive and they can chase you a long ways down the trail. So if you see an area on the forest floor where you see some hornets buzzing around, stay away from that because if you get too close, they're probably gonna come after you. So, but I think that's really, those are the things to be thinking about, not to be afraid of, but just to be aware of. So I was looking at some tracks here before I get off on poison ivy. And you can see, I hope, how well it shows up in the camera, but this is a, this is a horseshoe. So somebody was riding a horse down here. And um, not the kind of tracks we usually work with, but if you notice too, right behind you, Elliot, is another one. It's a mark on the ground there. So we have two horse tracks and then it's kind of hard to see the rest. So this horse didn't drop out of the sky and stick two feet on the ground and then fly up again. It was moving along this trail, obviously. 
And we can do something here as a demonstration maybe that the people who come to the tracking classes I'm sure are very familiar with. We're going to use the step length of this horse to find the next track. So assuming that it's going along at the same gate and hasn't changed speed, if we measure from the front of one track to the front of the next, we get about 38, 37 inches. So if I go from this one where I can't quite see the next track, knowing that it's around 37 inches zeroes me in on exactly where to look. And here we can see a mark on the ground right here. So that method can help you follow an animal trail that you have gotten to the point where you can't see the next track. Measuring the stride and then moving out and trying to find it can help find that next track. Okay. All right. There's some vining poison ivy on the back side of this tree and some on the ground here. We've got some more of those sedges floating in the water here, more than the other spot. Still doesn't look like it's growing here though. But if we wanted to find muskrats today, if that was our goal, we would need to find where the sedge is growing. Well, maybe we've got something here. Do you think you'd be able to get down here, Elliot, with the camera? Sure. I'll get down first and I'll let you let you come down. Um, what caught my attention here was on top of that rock right there. It looks like a little bean. That's muskrat scat. Muskrats often leave their scat on an object that's just above the water level. Could be a log or a rock. It starts off kind of bean shaped and then it weathers down into like a flattened patch. So if we looked around here, we probably will find some more like that that's, that's, that's flattened. But so we've got the, the sedges. Again, they're not growing here, but we've got some muskrat scat. The muskrats are here. And as I step down, I noticed this stuff over here. More muskrat sign. The scales are tipping here. These are freshwater mussels and that's good muskrat food. They'll bring them up from the bottom of the river and uh, up onto the shore and uh, have mussels for dinner. Let's see, you can see the coloration on those. Is there any more? Let's see if there's any more muskrat scat here. Is this a hot spot or not? Tough substrate for tracks. Oh, here's a scat. Oh, that's interesting. Here's an interesting one. 
want to get a picture of that right there, Elliot. I'm going to get my gloves and do this right. Okay. So we've got a tubular shaped scat along the edge of the water. Um, strange coloration and it's kind of whitish and pinkish. I'm going to use my gloves because uh, I want to model properly here for how to how to do this stuff. So what I want to do is break this up a little bit and see what it's made out of. Maybe I'll do one of the smaller pieces first. Put it on a on a rock right here, no poison ivy. Okay, so what I'm getting here is a few little fish scales and a lot of crustacean shell. Or is it crustacean? I don't know. I'm thinking of um, uh, crayfish. This pink stuff is crayfish shell. Seems like that's all that's in it is fish scale and crayfish. So this is an otter scat, most likely, almost for sure. And uh, so there's river otter coming up here too. That's pretty cool. This might be a good spot to sit with the camera some evening and see who, see who shows up. Okay. Oh, maybe I should say a little bit about otter scat. Um, a lot of times you won't see it in that tubular shape. The fish scales will be more in a flattened mass on the ground. And you want to look for otter scat along the waterways, but especially peninsulas. Anything that juts out into the water is a place where uh, you, you're probably going to find uh, some kind of otter sign. And most of the rivers and ponds and lakes around this area do have resident river otter so it's not an unusual animal to find but it sure is fun to fun to see them all righty how are we doing for time Elliot good okay we'll just maybe go just a, a little bit farther and then we'll We'll stop. Lots of holes here in the, um, the leaf litter. I find this to be one of the hardest substrates to work with is this decaying, wet decaying vegetation. Um, but we can see there's a whole bunch of holes. It's too small for a person. Could be a domestic dog. This would be a nice dog walking trail and I'm sure dogs would love to come running down here next to the water. But if you look off you can see a trail through the smart weed here. It doesn't exactly seem like dog behavior. It looks like it goes into the land over there rather than this way. Um, so I'm going to get closer and see if there's a track we can work with here. There's not much to see. So I'm going to see if I can feel the shape of the track. Sometimes that works really good. You have to be gentle when you do this because it's easy to change the track into what you want it to be if you stick your hand in it. So you have to be very gentle. And I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm feeling a field mark here. That ridge down the center of the deer track makes like a little mountain range, a little ridge down the center of these tracks. And in some of these I can feel the ridge. 
So this looks like deer, even though I can't show you a clear track. The deer are in here. Cool. Nice place to get a drink. We still haven't gotten to the muskrats. We got the floating grasses still. We would have to go up farther and we're not gonna have time to do that today. There's one other scat I saw back here somewhere. Somewhere, somewhere. Yeah, there it is. I saw it when I went by. Okay, uh, another cylindrical scat, right? So, um, a lot of possibilities. Domestic dog is a possibility. But um, if we were expecting it to be domestic dog, the contents would tell us a lot. It would be full of cereal. And everybody knows that terrible smell of domestic dog scat. Uh, I think it's because of the food they eat, but it's pretty, pretty smelly stuff. Wild canine scat, fox and coyote, doesn't have that smell. And it would be full of natural materials. It would be full of fur and bone fragments and uh, vegetation, fruit. It could be full of fruit as the season moves on, the berries. This is really soft and it looks like it's not full of cereal, it's full of vegetation. See the green in there? So this is Canada goose scat. Ken, is that a feather? No, I guess that's plant material. Uh, so Canada goose is another one right there. But wild canine scat, fox or coyote, we, as I said, would have fur and usually fur and bones and fruit and that kind of stuff. It would be a lot of times on the people trail. Again, it's a scent mark, it's a message, and uh, it's usually left in a prominent place on top of a rock or a root or in the middle of a trail. So, sign is everywhere, huh? so cool. And uh, I know we're running close to the end here, so I wanted to give a chance, maybe we could, I think this would be a good time to do some questions? Okay. Let's see if anybody has a question, and then let's see if I can answer it. A lot of people are asking, where, where are we? Where are we? We are on the Artichoke River in uh, West Newbury, Massachusetts. Tracking sign sheet that you had. Who's that from? The, the track card. The track card is David Brown, and uh, I believe his website is David Brown Wildlife Services, and he's in Central Massachusetts. You can get the book directly from him, or I think you can probably get it on Amazon too. His books. Yeah. Now there is a Tom Brown Jr. who's a master tracker who's written a lot of books, but this guy I'm talking about is a different person, David Brown. Yep. Last one there. Yeah, there are, there are any more questions. That's it. <laughs> okay, well, that's, I guess that's good, or is it? <laughs> I don't know. You've had 50 people watching this whole time. So. Oh, great. Well, thanks for watching, you know, and, and well, well, maybe it gives me a chance to do a few thank yous. I got some time here. So some people who have really helped me over the years, uh, my dear friend and mentor, Paul Rezendis, has to be at the top of the list. I thought I knew a lot about tracking when I met Paul, and he helped me see how much I didn't know. Um, and David Brown has written some beautiful books that I've written, that I've read, and it's helped me out a lot. Uh, Mark Elbrock. Mark Elbrock has done some amazing work and is still doing amazing work in wildlife research. If you have a chance to read anything that has his name on it, um, it's going to be a plus. And, uh, and thank you to all the participants that have come to my classes over the years. You've made it so much fun for me to uh, see you get all enthusiastic like, about scat like I do. It's been a lot of fun and I'm looking forward to doing it again. And along those lines, uh, we want to extend an invitation to folks to uh, come to classes when we get started again. We're hoping we can do it in September. Um, 
we're going to run a apprenticeship program in animal tracking for folks who like to really really get more intensive into uh, into learning this stuff and I'll be teaching that class I'm looking forward to that too so thank you again for walking with me and uh, I hope I get to meet you all soon <laughs>